Well, thank you for joining me on Side by Side today again. Today we're thinking about Proverbs chapter 4. And there are three things I want us to think about in particular. I want to think about the value of the past, the motivation for the present, and the key to the future insofar as gaining wisdom and its value in our lives. This passage begins with the father again speaking to the son, but in this case it's not just the father and the son, it's the grandfather, son and grandson. He says, When I was a son with my father, tender, the only one in the sight of my mother, he taught me and said to me, Let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live. And he is speaking to his son. He says, Hear, O sons, the father, and then he talks about his grandfather. It makes us think about the value of the past and the rich heritage that we have. So as we consider these words here, this grandpa to grandson and son, it reminds us of all those things, all those people in the story all the way back. I talk about the historic Christian faith. And sadly today, lots of people don't have any sense of that. No sense of the history of their church. Maybe their own church they're involved in has a very a very short history. It could be like one of the churches I'm helping to uh, in being involved in in London, Trinity Central, and their existence is just a few years. So they don't have a local congregation history. But then we all have a history because in common for us all is the history of the Christian traditions. And not only do we see the wonderful examples of the people who lived their lives wisely and proved the truth of the gospel over decades, but we can also see the lives of many others who didn't prove the gospel but proved another path, the path of what Proverbs calls the fool, rejecting the gospel. So many are equally well known emperors, generals, kings, rulers, pharaohs, politicians. All sorts of people who are very famous and who have left behind them lives that really are very tragic, but they're examples of making the wrong decision. In the past, such heroes as the Church Fathers really can inspire. I'm sure you might have your favourites, just like I do. I think of Polycarp. 86, she says, 86 years have I served my Saviour and he has done me no wrong and I am not going to deny him now being bound at the stake for his love of the Lord Jesus and following the path of wisdom and was was killed in the most amazing, miraculous way. But I'm not going to tell you all that story just now. And then moving forward into the fourth century, when you've got Augustine in North Africa, who, having chosen the path of pure selfish pleasure to begin with, hears the words of the Bible and rejects the path of the wicked and follows Jesus. But you can then think of people like Luther, Erasmus, Calvin, Edwards, Whitfield, Newton, Wilberforce, Lewis, Schiffer. There's so many that you can choose from, and I'm sure you have your own. Perhaps on your shelves, you're like me, you've got books, friends. Some of the ones that we read over the last summer remind me of lives like this. Corrie ten Boom, Isabel Kuhn, Pauline Hamilton, Francis Ridley Havergal. And those are all up there still on our YouTube if you want to go back and just take time and listen to their story again. No matter what the cost, we find it echoed in Jesus that the call to follow him is to offer up everything, see in him our treasure. And if we were to assess if we've made it by today's standards, well, it seems to me you've got to be reasonably young, fit, wealthy, trim. But you know, that's not really the way to be wise. By whichever way, and I quote Ray Ortland here, he says, by whichever way we choose, it's going to cost us all we have, whether you choose the way of the fool or whether you choose the way of the wise. So the past guides us, and secondly, the present motivates us. From verse 10 onwards in this same passage, he then begins again with those words that are so often introductory, hear my son and accept my words, that the years of your life may be many. How often do we settle for what we think to be the good road or the middle road? The middle road, that's the road of moderation. I kind of look at it as grade C if you're in the educational world. 
not an A star or not a fail, but grade C. That's what it just sort of moderate, moderation, compromise. In reality, this is not really possible. When you come to see in Proverbs, there are only two ways. And Jesus, of course, underlines that when he talks about the broad and the narrow way. And surely here in chapter 4, we can see it too. Because these verses are like a shock, a bucket of cold water first thing in the morning to wake us up to the reality that there's no way you can just go along with a little bit in the middle. Do you know how people say things like, well, do you know, I'm as good as they are, or I'm as good as many of those people who call themselves Christians. Well, that's not really the question, because it's not about comparing ourselves with others. I'll have to say, I feel often that my heart is at rest because of Christ. I know I may have sadness at my sin sometimes, but my soul, my soul is always able to sing Amazing Grace. There really are worlds of a difference between the two paths. When we choose Christ, as the Bible describes here, light dawns. There's a wonderful verse that you read in chapter, eight, in chapter 4, verse 18. The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until the full day. But the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. There are the two paths, the path that light shines brighter and brighter, and the path of the wicked darkness. I have witnessed the opposite of the path of light on many occasions in my ministry. And it, I'm reminded of C.S. Lewis's book, The Great Divorce, which is a sort of a parable of taking a bus journey from the outskirts of hell to the outskirts of heaven. There's a person in that who grumbles all the time and their grumbling begins grumbling about this and grumbling about that and eventually in the words of Lewis they become just a grumble. It's a little bit like the darkness gets darker and darker and darker until every light is extinguished and I don't know about you but I have certainly witnessed that in my life with people who hear the gospel, who see the opportunity of both roads, who may even have considered them in great de depth but having chosen repeatedly to reject the light and the path of Christ, their path becomes so dark that at some point in their life, it's as though if I'm ever trying to share the gospel or try to encourage them in thinking about spiritual things, they are totally deaf to that. It's so tragic. And then thirdly, there's the key to the future. And here we're told we should guard our hearts that's what it says, thinking about the future, my son. Again, those words introduce this. Guard your heart. Keep your heart with all vigilance. The heart is really important in this question of what we do, where we go, how we will end up, and how we respond to wisdom. 65 times in Proverbs, the heart is talked about. And you and I, when we think about our hearts, it's, of course, talking about that inner being. It's the place, I would call it, the real factory of results, where our desires, our longings, our beliefs, and our worship are all coming from. God works in our hearts. Satan blinds our hearts. We can harden our hearts. Isn't it? So true that when life has everything and still a person feels something missing, it's right down there in our hearts that we feel an emptiness. It's that space that was talked about by Augustine, a God-shaped space. And the heart is all about desire and longing. And we can still be misled as we struggle daily. We can still be fooled that Jesus is not enough. And we can still experience the power of unhealthy desires. We need to guard our hearts. And you know, one of the best ways to guard our hearts is to let God's word so impact our hearts constantly. For, because faith comes by hearing and that by the word of God. We bury it deep into our hearts. It shapes our thinking. It shapes our, our reflecting here. Let me finish with a quote of Ray Ortland's. And I know I'm just going to run over time a little bit today, but I hope you'll find this worthwhile. If you are right-handed, hold your right hand in front of you so that you can look at it. If you are left-handed, hold out your left hand. You do a lot with that hand, both good and evil. But how now dedicate that hand to Christ, 
He can make you wise all your life long with that hand. Here's what you need to remember. Jesus died for your hand. Yes, your hand. And he did not only die for the sins you committed with it. He shed his blood out of love for your hand to redeem your hand and make your hand wise in the present and immortal in the future to the praise of the glory of his grace. Someday your hand will be powerful for God such as you cannot imagine right now. Your hand will no longer feel pain. Your hand will no longer sin. Your hand will touch the hand of Christ. Everything you are will be redeemed. Let's keep the faith. Let's guard our hearts. Let's walk the narrow road. And we'll see you on Monday.